Good morning, Victory Fellowship. How are you all doing? You look great. You look great. Good morning to our family online. Welcome to another wonderful Sunday. First Sunday of March. The year is plowing away already. Unbelievable. But um, spring is upon us and so is Easter. So let's ah, be thankful to God to, uh, yeah, the progression of a great new year, 2024. And let's start it off. Start off this day in worshiping our Lord in gratitude for another a new day, new life.
filling our cups. We definitely go through moments in life where we feel parched, we feel dry, we feel empty. And so we definitely need, we need your living water. Holy Spirit, we just ask for you to fill us, Lord, just fill us. We empty ourselves of who we are and we ask for you to fill us with you because it's just, it's life everlasting. It's energy, it keeps us going, it's love, it's joy, it's kindness, it's goodness. So we just, we ask for more of you. Thank you, Lord God. Shall I feel you crushed the Welcome to Victory Fellowship. We're so glad that you can join us on this uh, blustery uh, March, March morning. Uh, 
Yeah, it's so great to see you, and thank you for joining us online as well. As you know, as we grow our new community here, re rebuild our community, one of the things that we've been emphasizing is that we would connect, that we move from uh, being friendly to friendship, to building friendships. And one of the ways is that we get to know each other's name, but also we get to know each other. And so uh, we've been doing this for a while now, and we're going to continue to do it. So we have a question for you. And I know this question, for some of you, you're going to have to go way back to answer this. And the question is this morning, as we get up and share, how old were you when you had your first job, and what was it? Okay, You don't have to say your age, where you are now, but how old were you back then when you had your first job, and what was it? So let's go ahead and uh, gather up, get out of our seats, and meet someone new, introduce yourself, and ask the question, answer the question.
if you can slowly work your way back to your seats. Thank you guys so much for uh, participating and uh, reaching out and, and sharing. Um, my first job, well, the first time I got paid was uh, I was 16 and I drove all that to Diamond Bar. My brother just bought a house back then. That's before Diamond Bar was developed as it was, as it is today. And so I would pull weeds for about eight to 12 hours, 16 hours at a time. It, it, it gets older as I, gets longer as I get older, but I was paid $30. For, uh, and included lunch, so that was good. But my first real job, I worked for free, and then I was able to be hired. I worked at Savons back then, part of the ROP program, and uh, I made, uh, I think, $3 or something an hour. But when I was working for free, the people there couldn't believe I was actually working for free. But I was like, well, this is the only way I'm going to get a job, and, and, and it worked out. So not that I made a career out of it, but that was my first actual job at 17 years of age at Savons. So anyways... All right, a few announcements before we get started. We have an all-church cleanup on Saturday, March 23rd from 10 a.m. to noontime. Uh, lunch will be provided. Uh, please come out, because Brian Kaba makes an amazing lunch. Right, Brian? You're still making lunch, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Just kidding. But see, Brian, there's some things we need to do to uh, clean up our church, and so you can see him if you, if you want to help. But if you're available that day, Saturday, March 23rd, from 10 a.m. to about noon, we're pushing at noon. Uh, if we get more help, uh, the faster it'll go, but lunch will be provided. And so uh, please, if you can help with that, we would greatly appreciate it. Uh, Easter's coming up at the last Friday of this month. On Good Friday, we have a Good Friday service at 7 o'clock. We'll be having a time of worship, a devotion, and a time of communion. And so if you uh, really want to experience a very intimate service, just like our Christmas Eve service, it'd be great for you to join us on Good Friday, March 29th at 7 p.m. And with that, two days later, we're going to be celebrating the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have an Easter Sunday service on Sunday, March 31st. Now, note the time change. It's not at 10 o'clock. The time is at 9.15 a.m. 9.15 a.m. We did this last year. But it's a time where we can just spend some time together, not only in service. We're going to have hula worship. Uh, we're going to have an Easter egg hunt, but we're also going to have a brunch. And we're inviting you to sign up uh, for that brunch. Pastor Kevin's uh, working on that sign up. Uh, we plan to have a, quite a few uh, visitors that, that day. And so the church is going to provide some of the main dishes. But we would like for you to, if you can, to provide a potluck dish as well. So that's... Uh, Easter Sunday at 9.15 a.m., and we'll probably conclude around 11, 11.15 or so, okay? So it's going to be a wonderful time where we can gather together as a church family to celebrate uh, our Lord together on Easter Sunday. All right. As you know, we've been talking about our vision statement. Our vision statement is this, growing in love <clears throat> and going in love. Growing in God's love and going in God's love. But how do we do this? How do we take these steps? How do we grow in God's love and go in God's love? Well, with this, we want to break it down for you. And you're going to be hearing these three words quite a bit throughout the year. And these three words, these three action steps are this. Engage, experience, and expand. Engage. What do we mean by that? We engage with God through worship, prayer, and his word. That we engage with God because it's a personal relationship, but it's a corporate relationship. And we worship God when we come to and gather together Sunday mornings. We gather together to pray. We talked about prayer for the last eight weeks. And then by gathering together, by studying and engaging in his word. With that, the next word is experience. We experience Christ-like living through our relationships. That as we gave our lives to the Lord, God transforms our lives. And with this, we become more Christ-like. And so we want you to experience Christ-like living not only through Sunday service, but through the relationship that we build through Sunday morning and throughout the week with our families, our friends, our coworkers. And so we experience Christ-like relationship. The third word is this, expand. That God doesn't just call us to be confined to Sunday mornings and to, the, the, to be confined to the four walls of our church, that we go out into the world, that we go out to the local community, but also the global community. And then we contribute this God's kingdom as God's kingdom expands throughout our lives. So we expand God's kingdom through the Holy Spirit by reaching our local and global community. And so you're going to be hearing a lot of those words. 
going, growing in God's love, but also going in God's love. And we do this by engaging, by experiencing, and by expanding. Engage, experience, and expand. So we're going to be elaborating quite a bit on that throughout the year. Okay, this morning we're starting a brand new series. It's entitled For the One. And for the past several weeks, we've uh, emphasized prayer. Prayer is that it's so important that we become a praying church. It's vital to who we are and what we do as a church, being involved not only in uh, the services here, but also being involved in our local and global community. Well, this new series is entitled For the One, The Savior Who Seeks and Saves. Now, this series is vital to help us understand what is important to God and what brings God joy. And we will delve into how God cares for those who are disregarded and ostracized by society and even the religious community. We also witness the profound love of God for those who are marginalized. Now, in this series, we aim to challenge you to act with faith and embrace Christ's mindset by examining Jesus' actions and seeking and saving. Because this is what Jesus did. He lived amongst us. And so this morning, we will examine Luke chapter 15, verses 1 to 10, to comprehend the essence of Jesus' heart and the purpose for his mission, why he came into this world. And so with that, uh, we're going to start. So as a huge child, I was a huge fan of baseball. I loved rooting for my favorite team. I haven't stopped the Dodgers. And with that, I also collected Topps uh, baseball cards. And I also collected miniature mini batting helmets. I loved it. And I had this, uh, mini co uh, this collection of mini batting helmets that looked like this. If we can show it, there you go. And so it looked just like that. Back then, to tell you how old I was, there was only 24 teams in the American and National League. And during the baseball season, I would line up these mini helmets based on the current standings of the teams. And I love to do that every, every game. After every game concluded, I would do that. Well, I live, I had a messy bedroom. And so once in a while, I would clean my bedroom. And then after I cleaned my bedroom, for some reason, I noticed that one of my mini helmets was missing from this collection. And I searched all over the house, and I just couldn't find it anywhere. And being a young boy, I was devastated because these are individual collectibles. And see, it had taken me quite some time to collect an entire set of 24 teams, but I couldn't find a replacement for that one lost helmet. And I'd been bothered. It bothered me greatly, and I couldn't find that one MLB mini helmet. I couldn't find it for months. And despite searching everywhere, I just kind of gave up. And I quit uh, putting them in order because I was just missing that one team. Now, I don't even know what happened to the collection at all. It's been decades. But I recently discovered that that one set, like the one I had, is worth over $500 on the collection market. 500 bucks. And I'm like, wow, isn't that valuable? And to this day, I don't know what happened to that collection. But can you imagine how valuable it would be if I still would have kept that, if I still would have kept the entire set? When something is valuable to us and we lose it, it can be painful. And depending upon its circumstance, depending upon its importance, it can be devastating and life-altering. God can feel that way. He can feel that same disappointment when someone strays from him. <clears throat> See, Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, that we can grieve the Holy Spirit when we disobey and fall away. And if our actions can grieve God, the opposite is this. How much greater joy does he have when something that is lost and disobedient returns to him? And so we're going to discover this in Luke chapter 15, verses uh, 1 to 10 this morning. So if you have our Bibles, open up to Luke chapter 15, and we're going to look at verses 1 to 10. And before we start, let's go ahead and pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you. You're good and gracious, Daddy. And so, Lord, I pray that you would meet us here, wherever we are in our spiritual journey, near or far. We're searching you or we feel disconnected from you. 
Or maybe we're just hanging on by a thread and we're so overwhelmed. Lord, may we find your comfort and grace and encouragement. So be with those who are watching online and be with everyone, Lord, who is here gathered together in person in this morning's service. Be with us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Let's start out by looking at verse uh, 1 to 2. Luke wrote, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Now, in a verse of our passage, verse 1 of our passage this morning, we see that the tax collectors and the sinners had gathered around Jesus to hear his words. However, as they drew closer to Jesus, the Pharisees and the religious scribes, the religious authorities, those who knew the scriptures and were uh, grounded in it, what did they do? Luke stated that they grumbled and they criticized Jesus under their breath, saying, this man only welcomes sinners and eats meals with them. The word grumbled in this context is the imperfect test, mean, tense, meaning that they continued to complain and criticize Jesus because he was socializing with outcasts and sinners. They continually did it. It wasn't one, uh, one time they did it, event. They constantly did it. Now, why were the Pharisees and the scribes grumbling about Jesus? The Pharisees and scribes were angry with Jesus because of an old rabbinic rule that stated that rabbis should not associate with the godless, the shameful sinners, let alone teach them. That God's word was only for those who were righteous, that had it together, that subscribed to the law. As a result, the religious leaders themselves, they shunned all the sinners and isolated themselves from them. They separated themselves. They did not show compassion or sympathies for those who they deemed to be wretched offenders of the Mosaic law. Now, who were the two groups that they grumbled about? In the Roman Empire, the Jewish uh, community shunned tax collectors. This is because they were deemed traitors when they cooperated with the Roman authorities to impose taxes on their own people. Moreover, the tax collectors were notorious for taking a cut from the taxes that they collected, and as a result, they were made quite wealthy because of this. They profited off of the hard working class. People who were struggling just to make ends meet were taxed excessively. Not only was this money going to the Roman government, but it was going to the pockets of the Jewish tax collectors. As a result, both religious leaders and the average Jewish individual distanced themselves from the tax collectors, and they held them in contempt. Can you imagine that? That your hard-earned money was not only excessively taxed, not only did it go to the government, but it was going to the people who collected your taxes. You would be outraged, and I would be too. Now, the religious leaders also shunned themselves from individuals who they considered to be sinners due to their activities, these godless activities, which is true. They were alcoholics, they were gamblers, they were beggars, they were prostitutes, and they were criminals, petty criminals, among other dubious activities that they participated, which violated the Mosaic law. Further, some individuals were uh, disabled or they were blind, and they were often blamed for this, their disabilities due to their sins or the sins of their ancestors. They were held responsible for their physical ailments. Now, it can be referred or inferred that these two groups of people did not regularly attend synagogue. One, because they would have felt unwelcomed and they were ostracized. And because of that, they didn't follow any of the religious practices because of their disobedience and because they were excluded. So you kind of see that there was this huge, huge divide between the two. Now, it's easy for us to criticize the Pharisees and the scribes for judging Jesus, right? I mean, it's natural, right? But when we look at our own hearts, we can be guilty of doing the same thing. See, although righteous standards are essential, this passage is about understanding God's love for the outcast and the lost. This passage is not about judging, not judging people, but it's about understanding God's heart for those who are outcasts. And how do we know this? God's word. 
In reaction to the religious leaders grumbling, this constant complaining and grumbling, Jesus told them this parable. And so let's look at the first parable, verse 3. So then he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. <clears throat> and when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my lost sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who needs no repentance. See, even though the owner, the shepherd, had 99 sheep, if one of them gets lost, Jesus said he will leave the 99 to search for the one until he finds it. And once found, he will carry the sheep on his shoulders, bring it back home. And when he comes home, the shepherd, the owner, will throw a huge celebration to rejoice over finding this one lost sheep and bringing it back. Jesus then gave a second parable to emphasize his point even further. So let's look at the second parable, verse 8. Or that woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Even though this woman has seven, uh, ten silver coins, if she loses one, Jesus says, doesn't she go to great lengths to find that one coin? Jesus said that she's so excited that when she finds that one last coin, she notifies everyone and she throws a huge party. She celebrates. Now, with these two parables, I want us to look at a few observations about this. See, one sheep out of 99 was lost. One coin out of 10 was lost. That one sheep and that one coin were valuable despite both owners having plenty in reserve. Because if you think, well, that's pretty good odds, right? I still have 99. One is lost. That's no big deal. I still have nine coins. One is lost. That's still no big deal. But that one sheep and that one coin were valuable despite both owners having plenty in reserve. Why? Because the sheep and the coin were lost. Well, how does this relate to us? How does this relate to those whom Jesus is speaking to? Here's the reality. The religious leaders, the Pharisees and the, and the, and, and the holy people, those who are leaders in the Jewish community, and the other group, the group of sinners, those who they criticize, they're both lost. They're both lost to sin. See, even though the religious leaders knew the scriptures and the right way of living, the reality was that they were lost. And they were just as lost as the alcoholics, the prostitutes, and the criminals. And so how does that relate to us? We, too, were lost. We're lost to sin's control. And despite how hard we try to be a good person and to do good things, despite how much religion we may have in us, no amount of religion is going to help us if we do it on our own. But what does this tell us about the heart of God? God has a deep compassion for sinners. God has a deep compassion for sinners. But let me clarify this. God hates sin because he is holy. Nobody with sin can come near him, let alone connect with him. But the reality is this. God doesn't hate sinners. He hates the fact that sin controls us. And the reality is this, that we are enslaved to sin. That is our natural nature, that we are enslaved and controlled by sin. Pastor Tim Keller said this, We're more sinful than we ever dared believe. 
And to forget this is to rationalize our sinful nature. If we do, this leads to a license to sin and permissiveness. But think about this. It's so easy for us who are Christians that we walk with the Lord, we go to church, we tithe, we serve, and all these things, and yet we set up this, this huge divide between those who we deem to be wicked and sinful. And then we look down upon them. But we have to look at our own hearts first. Because God knows that we have failed, and since we're enslaved to sins, he knows that we cannot rescue ourselves. He understands that we can't be saved by religious observance alone. God knows it takes more than our efforts to try to be a good person. Because I'll tell you, for a long time, I, I, I felt like, man, I was just not living up to what it means to be a Christian. I can't meet this standard. And I put all this weight and pressure on myself based upon good behaviors. And I'm like, I'm not meeting it. I can't do it. I want to try harder and harder and harder, and I just couldn't because I felt like I had to impress God. And if I did these right things and treated people the right way, yeah, I should, but I just couldn't. God knows it takes more than our efforts to try to be a good person. God knows our hearts despite of our external good behaviors. He knows our heart and our propensity to disobey him. But here's the reality, and here's the truth. God knows us deeply and intimately. And what he knows about us, they're not good. They're not good things. He knows the wretchedness of our hearts. He knows our uh, envy, our lust. He knows our competitive nature. He knows our judgmental hearts, our, our hearts that can be critical and looking down upon people. He sees that. So what does God do? Does he just leave us in that state and allow all of us to live in this condemnation of judgment and just be sent to hell? No. This is what Jesus is talking about. He has, God has his compassion for sinners. I'll tell you how much I struggle. A couple of weeks ago, the Lord really convicted me. We have a common family friend. And a few years back, there was a falling out. And seeing this one person in public, which I have ran to uh, come, in, come, come into contact a couple of times, was just really uncomfortable. Because you know how that is, right? Communication's not clear. Things are kind of unresolved. Well, recently, a couple of weeks ago, I saw this one person at an event. And I tried to be friendly and smile and things like that. But then I just received this mm, lukewarm response. And my defensive side wasn't like, oh, God bless you, you know? I got really upset, and I kind of just held it in, because the response took me aback, because I'm like, wow, we were once friends. I know we had this falling out, but do you have to react that way to me? So I went home, and I told Jenna, I said, you know what, I ran to such and such, and they just gave me this little response, and man, that, you know, and they're not a Christian or anything like that, so, it was, you know, I was like, I was really bothered. And then a week later, I found out that this person had lost some very close to them, they had passed away. And maybe that was the reason for their response to me. It wasn't an excuse, but the Lord convicted me because like, look at you knucklehead lawn. Look how you're reacting to this person. You don't even know what's going on in their lives. And you become so defensive, so critical about this person. You don't know what people are going through. Why do you have to respond that way? And I had to confess to the Lord. It was tough. And I told Jenna, you know, I'm sorry. Look at me. I'm a wretched sinner. I need God's grace even more and more. I need to be compassionate to people rather than defensive. How do you react to people that don't respond with the way that you expect them? Maybe you expect them to be nice and kind and friendly or respectful. And we, kind of, we, we that should happen, right? But what if they don't? What is your reaction to them? Is it similar to mine? As believers, we have to have compassion for people who are lost and struggling. And see, despite having plenty, the shepherd and the woman leave everything behind to search for their one lost item. 
And Jesus did the same for us. Jesus left the Father's glory in heaven to rescue lost people. And so what does this mean? That Jesus searches for us. He searches for us. He searches our hearts and he searches for us. Notice that this passage doesn't say that two or 20 sheep were lost out of the 99. Notice that it doesn't say three or five coins were lost out of the 10, right? Because that would warrant the, that person going for the, on, on this journey to find them. It simply says that even if only one sheep out of 99 or even one coin out of the 10 were lost, the owners would still go through extreme lengths to search for it. And remarkably, they are willing to leave the majority of the possessions behind to save just one. And Jesus did the same for us. He searches for us. And if you believe in Christ and you have faith in Christ, Christ has personally searched for you. You did not come to faith on your own accord or your own merit or because you're a good person. Christ chose to search for you to bring you into a relationship with him. And what does this mean? Every person living on this earth has value. The extreme religious person who thinks they have it all together has value to God's eyes and the most wretched of people. People controlled and dominated by sin, they're still valued and loved by God. And Jesus desires to save every single person. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 9 said this. Peter wrote, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. When the shepherd found the sheep, did he just leave it there? He said, oh, good, I found you. Now find your way back to the flock. No. He placed it on his shoulders and took it home. When the woman found the lost coin... <clears throat> Did she just leave it there and say, there you are, now I can go back home? And she just left it? No. She picked it up. She picked up the coin and brought it home. Not only does Jesus search for us, Jesus rescues us so that we can be with him. And despite of ourselves, despite of being uh, <coughs> enslaved to sin, Jesus rescues us. Jesus went on a rescue mission to save us so that we can be with him. And Jesus rescues us, and he carries us. And I tell you, there are many times where I needed Jesus to rescue me and to carry me because I can be that wayward sheep. And if we can go wayward away from Christ, God will go to great lengths to get our attention to return us to him. Pastor Tim Keller also said this, because of Christ, we are more loved and accepted than we can ever imagine. To forget this leads to legalism and moralism. We are loved and accepted because of what Christ has done for us. And we are loved and accepted more than we can ever imagine. Many of you know my testimony. I was 19 when I came to faith, when I gave my life to the Lord. And then I fell away from the Lord when I became a police officer. That became my God. That became my idol. And things were going great in my career where I just forsook God. I didn't need God anymore. I had all the things that I desired, all the things that I set out to accomplish and achieve. And I did away with God in my life. It came to the point where I became an atheist. I didn't believe in the Lord at all because I saw all this corruption and all these things that were happening all around me. And then little by little, my life was eroding. Things started to happen that went out of my control. Things started happening to me. It became very, very negative and pessimistic and angry. And it all came to an exploding end came to the point where I was going to take my own life. But then God brought me back to him. He broke me down. I was that wayward sheep. And he brought me back, screaming and yelling. But God loved me that much that he took me out of that really healthy environment, unhealthy environment, and he changed my life a second time. 
God loves us that much. You may be going through struggles right now, and the reason that you may be going through struggles is because God is trying to get your attention for something. That maybe there's something in your life that's not quite right, and the Lord's like, man, I'm allowing these things to happen in your life because I want you to see me here right now and how much I love you. And many times, our natural reaction is that we'll fight against God. And God's like, don't fight against me. Just yield to me. Listen to me. Because God loves us that much. See, because something incredible happens when a lost sinner comes to faith. And what happens? God celebrates when we repent. And how do we know this? Look at Luke 15, verse 7. Go back. Jesus said, just so I tell you that there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over, over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Luke 5, 15, 10 says this, just so I tell you that there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And what does it mean to repent? Repentance. It comes from the Greek word metanoo. It means to change one's mind, to despise one's past sins or way of life, to change directions, to move in the opposite direction, to change heart and attitude, to live godly. Jesus' message is this, is that God is a compassionate God towards sinners, but they need a Savior. Both the religious and the sinners were lost, and they needed salvation. And to receive salvation, they need to acknowledge their weaknesses and recognize the power that sin has over their lives. And we can come to Christ by asking for his forgiveness, which leads to repentance. And see, when you truly repent, you're not just saying, I'm sorry, God, for doing all these things. It's much more than that. When you truly repent, you no longer desire to live the way that you used to. You desire to live, to please the Lord. You desire to honor God. Your focus is not on yourself trying to become a good person because you know naturally you can't be a good person. You can only be a good person in God's eye when you rely completely upon the Lord. Because when you give your life to the Lord, you become a new creation in Christ. And God gives you the strength to give him glory and honor. God celebrates that when wayward hearts repent and turn back to him. When a person comes to faith in Christ, it's a huge party. I want to close with this last story. Um, as you know, many know that Jen and I will be returning to Cambodia as well as Robbie and Madison this, this summer on separate trips. And Cambodia, as you know, is, a, is just entrenched in extreme poverty. Um, life situations there are very, very difficult. Students, if they don't pass the comprehensive exams, even from kindergarten to first grade, they don't pass, they just drop out of school. Many of them don't know how to read, a lack of education, and all these things. And um, for the young girls, it's, it's a tough life. There's a lot of tra uh, trafficking there. And a lot of these girls, unfortunately, go into that lifestyle just to survive, to help the family out. Well, Bright Futures Cambodia is doing an amazing work there through education to providing opportunities for children, for families, especially those who are most impoverished. And it's a blessing to be a part of that. And so I meet with Pastor Chun Li every, every week, every Monday, and we just get together and we talk and we, and, and we pray. And so this past week, I'm going to show you a picture. This girl in the middle, um, she's blind. If you notice, the, both the that her sister, they don't have any shoes. This is how they just get, along, get around in, in their neighborhoods. Um, she's been attending this uh, service. They call it the sewing center, where they do sewing, for several weeks. Well, last Saturday at their sewing service, Pastor Chunli issued a, a call to accept Christ, and she accepted the Lord. This blind little girl who doesn't have any education at all, is coming out to the service just once a week, just for anything. And she gave her life to the Lord. And Pastor Tony just shared with me, I just, I couldn't help but break down and cry because 
In the world's eyes, this girl is not valuable. She doesn't have anything to offer. And yet she's valuable to Christ. She's valuable to God. There's nothing that she ever did to warrant salvation, to warrant Jesus coming into her life. Nothing. Except for the fact that God loves her and created her. And when Pastor Chinley shared this with me, he said, Pastor, the angels are celebrating right now because this one girl repented and gave her life to the Lord. She experienced salvation. And she's walking with the Lord now. And please pray for her because there's not a lot of resources for her being young, being a female, and being blind. But the Lord will take care of her. And the blessing was is that Bright Futures Cambodia was able to provide a bike for her younger sister. If we can show that uh, picture again. Her younger sister just received a bike so that she can ride to school rather than walk. It takes her hours to walk to school. And so we have video of her just riding this bike. Once again, no shoes or anything on. But the joy that they have. And her sister now accepted the Lord. This one life that the world doesn't deem to be valuable, God deems to be valuable. So what is the big idea this morning as I close? Have compassion. Not on the loss, just have compassion for people. Be gracious and don't be critical like me when I feel like I'm offended. And then pray for the one in your life. Jesus went to save one. Jesus left to save just one. God left heaven to save us because we're the one. And I pray that you would think and search in your heart about one person that needs, that should, and has to come to salvation for the one. Pray that you recognize how much Jesus loves you and has rescued you. We pray that this morning you would commit yourself to praying for the one person who doesn't know the Lord and pray for their salvation. That you would commit to that, just that one. And you would pray for them and don't stop praying for them. And you would offer an invitation for them to come out to church or, or to join you for a meal or for anything that you could connect with them and share of your story and your testimony and how the Lord has searched for you and found you. Because our faith isn't just about ourselves. It's not just contained to ourselves. That we share this joy of the Lord and how the Lord has rescued us and saved us. And he uses us to reach the one. And so will you commit to that in praying for the one? As a child, I experienced great sadness over the loss of my one mini batting helmet. But you know what? I've received far greater joy knowing that Jesus has rescued me and save me because I was the one that was truly lost. Nothing in this world, money, career achievements, anything, fame, order, and nothing can be compared to being rescued by Jesus and the joy and the elation found by being rescued by Christ and being in a relationship with him. And this, we want Christ to work in your life so that you can pray for the one to be rescued by Jesus. Pray for the one in your family, at work, at your school, in the local community, or even in the world. This is your opportunity now. We're going to close our worship time with communion. Um, it's the first Sunday of the month, and we invite you to come forward to partake in the elements this morning. We don't ask uh, that you become a member of our church because we don't have a, a membership, but we ask two things. One, that you've given your life to the Lord that you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And the second thing that we ask is that if you have anything against your brother and sister, that you would confess that to the Lord, that you would acknowledge that, and you would ask for the Lord's forgiveness, that you could come to the table with a clean heart. And so with that, um, I'm going to pick up this element now.
And Jesus offered his body as bread. He said, take and eat, for this is my body given to you. And then Jesus took the cup, the wine, that represented his shed blood, that was going to happen on the cross of Calvary. Take and drink, for this is my blood offered to you, for the removal of all of our sins, past, present, and future. And with this, we come to the table with a humble heart, but a gracious heart, knowing that we didn't earn this, that Jesus paid for this for us. And because he rescued us, we are saved. He changed our life. And we celebrate this, but we also thank the Lord for his goodness and his sacrifice for us. Because the reality was this, we did not deserve it, but he did it for us anyways. And we rejoice with a thankful, grateful heart. So I invite the worship team to come forward. Uh, at any time during the worship set, if, if you le- feel led to come forward. And it, if you need prayer or anything like that, I'm here. Uh, Pastor Kevin's actually upstairs, but I'm, I, I'm here to pray for you. If you want to pray during the worship time or at the end of service, I'm here to pray for you. And Pastor Kevin's available as well after service. But um, let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you, Jesus. That one, for the one, was so valuable that you left heaven for the one, for us. It wasn't about numbers. It was about one. And so, Lord, how grateful and thankful we are. And Lord, I pray that you would revitalize our hearts and our minds, Lord. That we rejoice in our salvation. Lord, that you would deal with our critical, judgmental hearts that we would commit to praying for the one in our lives so they can experience salvation, that they can experience repentance, and they can experience a new life that is grounded and founded in you. So thank you, Lord, in reaching us. May you use us, Lord, to reach others who don't know you. So Lord, bless these elements now. Bless this uh, cracker that represents, the, this bread that represents the broken body of your son. And bless this juice that represents the shed blood of your son on the cross of Calvary for the removal of our sins, past, present, and future. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Anytime we invite you to come up uh, to participate in taking communion. Thank you.
so precious to you, even when we can be rebellious, stubborn, and, you know, make our own choices and make choices that sometimes just are downright not good. You love us, and like the parable of the prodigal son, you are waiting for us with open arms to come running back into your arms. Jesus, you go for the, you go after the one sheep and the 99 are okay. Like that woman who searches for that one coin when she's got the other, she's got the other ten. So we just thank you that we can come to your altar. We can come to your cross, Jesus, and always, always, always get your forgiveness. Thank you for what you did on the cross, Jesus. Amen. As the deer path is full, the water so my soul longeth that. soak in your presence 
We can soak in the joy, the peace, the comfort of your presence, no matter what we're going through, whether we are um, on the mountaintop victorious, uh, praising your faithfulness and your goodness, or we're in the valley and we're desperate for you. And we just need, we need your comfort. We need your peace. No matter where we are, Lord God, we can just bask in your presence and worship you. Because worship is not just adoration, Lord God. It's, it's a weapon. It's warfare. And uh, worship just changes atmospheres, moves mountains. It's just as powerful as prayer. It's just as powerful as fasting. So thank you that worship brings us into your presence, Lord God. And it just encloaks us with your love and your protection, your everything. So we just adore you and we thank you, Father God. Amen. As we continue to engage God in worship, I invite you to stand for the last song. You are good.
sing no other name Jesus Jesus my heart will sing no other name Jesus Jesus Amen thank you thank you Flo thank you Gary um, thank you so much for joining us. Let me just clarify. God did not call me a knucklehead. I felt like a knucklehead, so God did not call me a knucklehead. I want to clarify that. I'm kind of hard on myself, you know, but he did not call me a knucklehead, so um, just to clarify that, I felt like a knucklehead. Okay, with that, you knucklehead pastor, let's, um, let's close with this. We added a few more words. It's the words engage, experience, and expand, okay? So we're going to recite this together as we close in closing prayer. Father, help me to engage with you by living this day to the full, being true to you in every way. Jesus, help me to experience Christ-like love by giving myself away to others, being kind to everyone I meet. Holy Spirit, help me to expand God's kingdom by loving the lost and proclaiming Christ in all I do and say. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, you are so good. Jesus, that you left you left the rest to just save us, the one, Lord. And I pray that there would be revival in our hearts, Lord. That our lives just wouldn't focus on ourselves and what we can get from this world. But we give our lives to you. Not because we have to, because we want to. And I pray, Lord, that you would bring to our hearts and minds the one that we can pray for, for the one. That we can pray for them, Lord. And that you would save them, Lord. Use us, Lord, in immeasurable ways to reach the one as you reached the one, Lord. You reached us. So thank you, Father. Bless your people now. May we have a wonderful Sunday and a great, amazing week, Lord, as we walk intimately with you, growing in your fullness and your grace, Lord, and your conviction as well. Bless us, Lord. Bless you, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, We'll continue next week on For the One, and uh, have a great and wonderful Sunday. Thank you for joining us online as well.